The following special episode of Addressing Gettysburg is brought to you without commercial interruption by our Patreon page. Just go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg so you can help support the show and keep it going and growing. We've got a lot of big ideas for the 160th and they need to start being produced now. So the more patrons we could get, the better. Just go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg and help us help you. That's patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. And we thank you in advance. Now, on with the show. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg. July 1st, 1863 is what we're talking about today. It's the 159th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. And uh, who better to join us on this first anniversary episode of 2020 than our uh, mortal enemies, the guys who we hate so much and they hate us back. Uh, I'm speaking none other <laughs> of Jim Hessler and Eric Lindblade from the Battle of Gettysburg podcast. Welcome, gentlemen. Oh, you crazy man, you. Welcome, new I best know. buddies. <laughs> I know. Wait, wait, weren't we referred to as... What was it? The Others? Or what the were other, earlier? The so Other Gettysburg Podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think others. it was just The Other Group. Or the something. Other yeah. Group. <laughs> yes. yes. You, know, you know, this whole there's no rivalry is really becoming such a cliche yeah. that maybe we should go back we to We should go back to hating each open other. Open warfare. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Let's start a podcast yeah. war. Yeah. Yes. Yes. After we finish tonight's after this. recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, well, yes. yeah, after tonight. And also other future collaborations. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Because I know you love that word. Yes, I do love collaborations. <laughs> and the word brand. We could have oh, a yes. high-stakes uh, we should brand. arm wrestling competition. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be fun. Um, or not. I never said you weren't bigger. I just said, you know. <laughs> but I think I might be the only one here who can afford a lawyer, so I think that would be okay, too. So. That's probably accurate. It's probably true, too. Yeah. Uh, all right, so listen. Oh, that's fine. I'll just use a public defender, like the people. <laughs> you, you, you can tag on to my guy. Oh, ah, sweet. Yeah. All right. You're one of the people. Well, we are a tag team, so we I guess that, that also matters even in legal. I mean, you can see, like, one day, like, Arn Anderson's busted, and Tully's like, oh, I got your back. We'll go in together on I this. I was just thinking we were like the Anderson brothers. We it's, are. The simpatico well, is we amazing. are cousins. Yeah, that's a gimmick that hasn't really caught on. I didn't go anywhere. That, are you helpful. actually cousins? We are. We are, yes. We, we were doing research on uh, Ancestry, and it turns out we are uh, not so distant cousins. There was a branch of the tree in Minnesota or yes, something. That, yeah. yeah. No kidding. Yeah. 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 Really? Our, our yeah. And how weird is that, that you both ended up here and doing a podcast together? I had an uncle uh, named Oli. He had an uncle named Arn, and it turned out that they were, uh, you know, Related. This sounds like a Rose yeah. Nyland story is about to yeah. begin. Well, you know, I am I am of Scandinavian descent. Yeah, you know, I couldn't Lindblade, tell from... Lindblade is a Swedish last name, so an offshoot of that is Anderson. Um, you know, your various Olis, your Arns, your Jeans. You know, just you know, just typical good old Scandinavian names, and here we go yeah. through the use of DNA technology. It's amazing. Oli, here we are. Oli Hessler. It just <laughs> runs off the tip yeah, of your Yeah, well, that's a good German name, though. <laughs> All right, we're probably right. not here to do that. No, we're not. People are going to fast forward right through this whole part. <laughs> All right, so July 1st, well, 18th. You say we mess laugh. around too much. <laughs> uh, do they say that about you too? Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, no, yeah, yeah. yeah. You joke around too much. Yeah, you guys do, yeah. take forever. Some people, like on the YouTube version of these shows, some people will go in the comments and they'll they'll put the timestamp as to when we actually start talking about history. <laughs> God bless them, because when I, I go back to listen to this <laughs> crap, I, I go straight to that. Yeah, Please. well, I delete them when I find them because I want people to hear the wonderful of the community that we've built. So, Good for you. Yes, thank you. Speaking also, of which, it's your show. It's my show, and I can do whatever the hell I want to do. But, and, and, and the other thing, we I've spent a lot of time with Jim in the last four or five days. Uh, right? We said, when did I see you? Well, we, <laughs> do, you do you need me to recap? Could you please? So we did a we did an electrifying East Cavalry field tour That's on right. Saturday. Saturday. June 25th. Custer's Not death. a coincidence of the date. No, no. Uh, with, with, with six questions. Six Mike. questions. That was a birthday present from him to me so I thank you for that Mike yeah. and then what Sunday morning we had the tour with J.D. Hewitt and uh, us and you guys you guys did the tour I don't really know why me and Eric and six questions were there but we had fun anyway it was, a, was good a good tour time. we had a good time yeah, yeah, it was yeah. A good, yeah I think a lot of people 
enjoyed it. They, they did. We had a good crowd for it. Yep. And and also, I think a lot of people saw some perspectives of the battlefield they've probably never seen before. Yeah. Which it, I think is even cooler. Most so. people don't walk that path that we walked, and those people don't go stand in and around the Sherfy barn and everything. And, and, you know, I wore that sickle shirt again, really just as a gag to get a laugh. And here we are three days later, and I'm still getting hate mail on Facebook from people who were <laughs> triggered by the sickle shirt. Really? So, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Even, a, I believe, a lawyer, as a lawyer, he gave his legal opinion on, on the case. Ah. That was fun. Well, that's interesting, at least. Yeah, yeah. But the tour was about Longstreet, and here we have Sickles stealing the show once again. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, you that, know what? Isn't he the show stealer? Yeah. He is. He's the everything stealer. I don't yeah. know what that means. Well, uh, all right. Monument funds, well, women, wives, deposed yeah. monarchs. Exactly. You know. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so let's get into the battle so people can get their panties out of a wad here. Battle of Gettysburg begins July 1st. Um, just briefly, if you will, let's start on the 30th, though. Set the stage for the fighting on the 1st. Whoever wants to start can start. Well, the day before, it was a hot and sunny day, Matt. Mm -hmm. No, it's, uh, you know, June 30th. By that point, General Lee is roughly a month into his summer invasion. Uh, he has already, on June 30th, basically received intelligence that the Union Army is moving up through uh, Maryland and into Pennsylvania, is closer to him than he has realized. So Lee has already issued orders to his corps commanders, specifically Richard Ewell, uh, up near the uh, Harrisburg area, to start pulling back and uh, coming in towards Gettysburg. Uh, meanwhile, on the uh, Army of the Potomac side, George Gordon Meade and his second day in command of the Army uh, is considering a fallback position, so to speak, uh, in Carroll County, Maryland, what we know today is the Pipe Creek Line. So Meade is considering that, but at the same time, his Army is on the move. Uh, he has advanced elements of his cavalry. General John Buford is in Gettysburg uh, scouting, and Eric, I I believe he uh, has a near collision that afternoon with some uh, Confederate fellas that you might be a little acquainted with. That is a perfect segue. So what we'll see at this point on June 30th, advancing from the Cashtown area, is Johnston Pettigrew's Brigade, or a part of Johnston Pettigrew's Brigade. He'll have the 11th, the 26th, and the 47th North Carolina with him. The 52nd is actually detached, covering approaches from Fairfield. Well, and actually run into some of Buford's men. There'll be a small skirmish near Fairfield on June 30th. Mm. But Pettigrew's orders that day is to advance towards Gettysburg, look for supplies. One of Lee's main goals coming into Pennsylvania is to live day-to-day -day off the land and refit his army. So as Pettigrew's men are advancing towards Gettysburg, he has in his back of his mind what Lee's overarching orders are. Don't bring on a general engagement unless you can do so to an advantage. So what that's saying is, if you don't know what's in front of you, if you don't have a firm grasp, use caution. But if you know you can win, you know you can drive what's ever in front of you back, by all means do so. So as Pettigrew's men reach Seminary Ridge, in fact, uh, one citizen of Gettysburg will note that uh, some of Pettigrew's skirmishers actually advanced into the outer edges of Gettysburg itself. As he's looking to the south from Seminary Ridge, he'll see a cloud of dust coming up from the Emmitsburg Road. It's, of course, John Buford's Cavalry Division entering Gettysburg. As he does not know the size of the force, he's going to hear cheering in the town. One soldier will remember even hearing a drum beating. And, of course, if you hear this and you mm -hmm. hear a cloud of dust, you hear a drum, it's not crazy to think that might be infantry. Right. With Pettigrew not knowing what he sees, he falls back. Ridge to ridge to ridge. As he keeps falling back to the west, he notices these troopers keep following him. He quickly surmises... You know, that's not local militia. Right. They're not that brave. Too bold. So he says, you know, that might be the lead element of the Army of the Potomac. And as we think about you know, these troopers fanning out in front, they don't really fan out a tremendous amount. Usually you're looking at most maybe 10 miles. So Pettigrew, I think, makes the wise call. Now he does what a good officer does. You report it up the chain. He'll first report it to Henry Heath, his division commander. Heath does not believe what he's saying. About this time, A.P. Hill arrives. As Heath and Pettigrew are debating this, Heath says to Pettigrew, Pettigrew, tell Hill what you just told me. And Pettigrew will tell A.P. Hill, I believe this is the lead element of the Army of the Potomac. Mm -hmm. Hill's initial response is, that's odd, because I just came from Army headquarters. 
General Lee didn't mention anything of the such, hmm. which I think is a very telling moment because Lee gets knowledge where the Army of the Potomac is around June 28th. Two days later, he's still working on the assumption that they have maybe not met, left the Frederick, Maryland area. Right. And I think it's very telling what's going on at Confederate High Command. Of course, Pettigrew, despite his best efforts, cannot convince them. Eventually, Heath will turn to Hill and say, can I advance my division tomorrow? Hill says, by all means. And, of course, this now sets the stage for the collision, according to legend, around 730 in the morning of July 1st. So Buford, in the meantime, uh, yeah. what is he doing? Yeah, so I'm glad you mentioned that. So Buford is in Gettysburg. He spends the night of June 30th basically bivouacked in and around the seminary and on the ridges west of the town. But I think what's important is that night he pens a note, which is fairly accurate in terms of the uh, scale and the scope of the intelligence, basically to the effect that he knows Ewell is coming in from the north uh, and that the main body of the Army of Northern Virginia seems to be massed in and around Cashtown and to the west of us. That's important because intelligence from that intelligence from Buford and then similar intel from uh, the railroad guy, Herman Haupt, that confirming that Lee and Ewell have fallen back from the Harrisburg area is going to end up with General Meade and is going to greatly inform some of Meade's uh, uh, planned movements for July 1st. Now, you mentioned Herman Haupt. Go into that a bit because we don't really hear a lot about the intelligence from Haupt. What intelligence, how did he get it? Yeah, well, what happens is coming in through Harrisburg is a confirmation of the fact that Ewell is no longer threatening the city and has already started to uh, pull back beyond the Susquehanna and mm. starting to head down towards Gettysburg. So George Meade starts to realize that, okay, my own advance seems to have helped relieve the pressure on Harrisburg. Lee's army has fallen back, and now Meade is thinking, okay, I can look for somewhere in southern Pennsylvania or, again, perhaps in Maryland to concentrate and to meet Lee's army. So it's very, army. Yeah, so it's very important because it kind of informs what Meade and the Army of the Potomac are going to do on the 1st. And I think an interesting point about Herman Haupt, he was actually a former resident of Gettysburg. Really? Before the war. Oh, uh, I didn't know that. He was actually, a, I believe, a professor of mathematics yeah. at Pennsylvania College. Actually ran a small school on Seminary Ridge, but he was most noted for being probably the nation's leading expert in tre railroad trestle design. Right, right. So he had gained a lot of notoriety for that. Uh, so I think it's kind of interesting, a guy that's going to have a really important role in the Gettysburg campaign at one point just the fate of life was a resident here of Gettysburg. Yeah. Have, have you never seen his house on Seminary Ridge? I have, but yeah. I thought that that was post-war. I never knew that was uh, before the war. So yeah, that's obviously uh, considerably expanded and uh, yeah. you know <laughs> beyond what it was in 1863. That would have been a pretty good dig in 1863 for Absolutely, the Absolutely, though. Um, all right, so morning of July 1st. Get us started. Blade. Well, what we have is the lead portion of Henry Heath's division, James Archer's brigade of Tennesseans and Alabamians are making their way down the Chambersburg Pike towards the east, towards Gettysburg. Uh, as they near Marsh Creek uh, fr in front of them from Knoxland Ridge, according to legend, Lieutenant Marcellus Jones of the 8th Illinois Cavalry squeezes the trigger of a carbine and the first shot of the battle is fired. Now, of course, we really don't know who fired the first shot of the battle. Needless to say, someone does. What this will cause is skirmishers to deploy in front of Heath's division. And for subsequently really the next two hours, Heath's men will be pushing these skirmishers back towards McPherson's Ridge. Now, do you not believe that it was someone from the 8th Illinois that fired the first shot? It's one of those things, <laughs> as a historian, how do you really prove what is the first beyond a reasonable doubt? Uh, we have accounts that actually where we are right now on, on Barlow's Knoll to our north. Uh, possibly the first shot w was fired. There are a number of individuals that claim that. And for the veterans, certainly it was a point of pride and a, a point of honor. And it's one of those things, does Marcellus Jones fire the first shot? I can't tell you one way or the other if he did. Was he probably one of the ones that fired one of the first shots? I think you could say that. Could It could be, though, that he, he fired the first shot that led to millions more, whereas the guys up north here, it didn't. Well, that's it. I mean, with cavalry vedettes scattered all around Gettysburg, who knows? Yeah, yeah. But regardless, it starts out there on the Chambersburg Pike. Um, about how long is the cavalry fighting, and how hard of a fight is it? 
Well, the cavalry fighting, Buford's going to delay the advance into Gettysburg for several hours. Now, of course, the popular conception today is sort of a little bighorn Alamo kind of <laughs> last stand, you know, under he- under heavy pressure with um, uh, perpetuated in many ways by the movie, which yeah. you know, I, I kind of hate that I'm up bringing into the conversation already. Huh? But uh, part of the whole deal. Yeah. I mean, obviously, what Buford is really doing is Buford is harassing them. You know, he is fighting that delaying action. He's harassing them. He's slowing down the Confederate advance. And, you know, ultimately, I think Buford's going to report something in the neighborhood of two to three percent casualties for the entire battle. So it's not it's not heavy in terms of human casualties, but it does get the job done in terms of delaying the advance. Are you okay? Yeah, I got a tickle in my throat. Go ahead. Delaying the advance until, obviously, infantry supports can arrive on the scene. And that's the real significance of what he does. Now, so does the movie, uh, since you brought it up, uh, yeah, you know... They- kick me for bringing that up. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. For more <laughs> information on the movie, check out our movie episode on the Battle of Gettysburg podcast. The, uh, the, the um, uh, you know, there is a point, though, where there uh, it would be uh, McPherson's Ridge. They're, they're in a battle line behind... <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Hold on. <a second. coughs> I got this. What are you? I've got what? a little tickle too, but you, you're going to edit that part out. I bet. Yeah, I bet the part where Matt coughs and gags, he'll find time. <laughs> <Absolutely. laughs> right. What are again. you, a lunger? No, not yet. Died of the consumption. It's the black lung pop. Buried in the Alms House Cemetery. Isn't that where we all want to be buried? Absolutely. <laughs> Actually, that, I'm amazed more people don't do that as their wish. You know, if the rate's at Evergreen, you can get it and plenty much of cheaper open space. and actually in a pretty yeah. cool location. Plenty of open space. Yeah, it's an awesome location. You know, just make sure you die in Gettysburg. No one, your, make, your last wish is that no one in your family claims your body. Yes. And you'll make your way here. So You can lay in the shadow of Francis Channing Barlow. Oh, for all God. Time. Yeah, I don't so, want to be buried here. So follow me for more uh, end-of-life planning. <laughs> is, it, is any of this going to make it on the air? Or probably. Kind of okay, probably. Right, just, right. Yeah. Because right. it was good. All right. So now, before you were so rudely interrupted by my coughing. Yeah, where the hell were we? I don't remember now. What were you saying? We were you talk- were talking about... Uh, oh, so my question. In, yes. yeah, yeah, so the movie makes it look like, you know, there is a point where they actually get to a, a battle line and they're holding off the Confederates. Is that true in any degree? Not really. I mean, again, Buford does Buford does fall back and ultimately does take up a position on McPherson's Ridge. But that sort of hard-pressed battle line with, you know, sweat pouring down Sam Elliott's face is, you know, you know, comes in and tells Gamble to deploy everybody and, and all of that stuff. No, I think that's overblown. Okay. That doesn't mean, and again, because, you know, we're going to have the anti-cavalry people Kind Eric. of going, oh, I knew it, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Like like Eric, Here the producer, <laughs> sitting to my left kind of thing. Uh, but from Cavalry, you know, by Cavalry standards, it's a good little fight. It's just not that that okay. last stand kind of thing that's so desperately portrayed on the big screen. And, All right. Uh, and yeah, I yeah, often say with Buford, what he does on July 1st isn't extraordinary. No, it's not. He does what was expected of him. Mm-hmm. And sometimes in history, when someone just does the job they're expected to do, it has a tremendous impact. Yeah. And and I think we're not saying just because they don't have casualties, it's not important. You know, if, if the grand goal is to then ha- have casualties inflicted on you in war, that's a really twisted Silly. means yeah. of success. <clears throat> yep. And and Buford is going to do his job. He knows he needs to buy time to get Reynolds onto the field. He and also we need to keep in mind too. His main line is McPherson's Ridge. Mm-hmm. It's not all the way out where some might associate with the first shot marker. It's just little harassing bands that are just slowing the Confederates, and it's also not the entire brigades of Davis and Archer that are bearing down right, on the right. skirmishers. Yeah. Right. So the skirmishers are, are pushing forward. You still have most of Heath's men in column. Yeah. At this point, what what Buford really does well, in my opinion, and this goes back to the June 30th conversation, is the intelligence yeah. and the scouting yeah. that he's providing for the Army of the Potomac. The information he's giving the high command is relatively clear and accurate compared to some of the things that are coming in from Pleasanton and Kilpatrick and other guys. Buford is really first and foremost should get credit for that. Yeah. Tactically, what he's doing, could David M. Gregg have also done the same thing with the skirmish line right. west of town and delayed the advance probably mm-hmm. 
So again, Custer. Right. it's not it's yeah. not that he <laughs> it's not you know that he I made it say, up. No, I didn't say Custer. Let's be honest. Custer would have mounted up that seventh he Michigan. Right he would have <laughs> yeah, gone, exactly. gone charging right over Whistler's Ridge. Yeah, exactly. Would have been game, there would be no Battle of Gettysburg. Well, actually, he would have just scattered he would those have rebels. Defeated them single handedly. While we're giving credit to folks, should we just wait for this to go? Oh, back? go ahead, go ahead. It's the sounds of the battlefields. While we're while we're giving credit, you know, we should also give credit to one General John Pope. Before his ill-fated second Manassas campaign, he pulls some union officer off of a desk job named John Buford. There you go. Had Pope not done that, had he not been defeated at Second Manassas, maybe John Buford's on a desk in Washington yeah. on July 1st, 1863. What, that's the, the episode you should do, is what if Buford were not at Gettysburg instead of what if Jackson were? But the reality is, though, is if Sam Elliott does not appear in Roadhouse and then get cast in Gettysburg, you know, if somebody else gets cast as Buford, that's less true. memorable, we're really not talking no. about him today. Charles Bronson as Buford? Uh, yeah. Looks more like him. Yeah, he does. I mean, that's can, actually can you not imagine, bad. like, Thank Death you. Wish 27, yeah, Gettysburg? <laughs> actually, it would be Death Wish 1863. <laughs> yeah. Was he dead by that point? Charles Bronson? Yeah, when did he die? Uh, maybe. Yeah, he might have been dead. Some, I don't know. I mean, Vincent Price was up. dead for the last five years of his career, but they still brought him out. <laughs> I can't believe we were talking about John Pope. No, yeah, but wild. that's that's how good Eric is. He just See, knows how to tie those things in. You get. AG yeah. first. Yeah, there you all right. go. Well, so, all right. So, the infantry gets here. First Corps this is the first Corps to arrive. Yeah. Uh, how does that all unfold? Well, Reynolds has been coming up the Emmitsburg Road all morning. Uh, I think... He's probably coming up to Gettysburg primarily to support Buford. There are accounts if Reynolds is on the march basically saying to the effect that Reynolds isn't even thinking he's going to see any action today. He's just going to come mm-hmm. up. He thinks he's going to support Buford, and then presumably Buford is going to move out from there. Um, but obviously things go differently than that. So as he's coming up the Emmitsburg Road, he approaches Gettysburg. He hears the sounds of gunfire, uh, starts to have uh, General James Wadsworth's division basically cut across field from the Emmitsburg Road towards Seminary, towards seminary um, Ridge beyond. Cutler's Brigade is going to deploy north of the Chambersburg Pike, kind of where the um, railroad cut is mm-hmm. in that area. And then south of the Chambersburg Pike, going to be Solomon Meredith's brigade. Yes, folks. The Iron Brigade <laughs> and also arrives Park on the Cutler's field. Brigade. Well, okay. is on that side of the road. Too. Well, okay, he's going to nitpick. He's okay, split. there's yes, a couple yes. regiments yeah. on that side. <laughs> of the pike. You think I'm going to give the Iron Brigade all the credit yeah. here? <laughs> you know why? Do, why is it? Well, when I, why is it when I always hear we're not going to go into many details? We always go we always into go details, to details, anyways. So. Well, when the Iron Brigade does, does uh, do any of Cutler's regiments go across Willoughby Run later on, like the Iron Brigade does? Or does the well, Iron Brigade just do that? Uh, that's a good question. Not I'm, that I can I'm, think of. I'm tagging I, that. I'm tag- I think I know the answer I'm to that question. I'm tagging that just the Iron Brigade. So you're an Iron Brigade mm. aficionado, Well, I mean, huh? just because he's trying to take away credit, you know, but, you well, know, just Since he interrupted me, I'm on your side with this one. <laughs> oh, but see, you get, but but everyone dings you for interrupping me, so well, turn about one guy, Well, one guy dinged me for that, but in reality, you never let me finish a sentence. <laughs> well, So here know, we go. To each their own. <laughs> well, all right. Enough with that. I'm going to interrupt you both. Continue with the story of the battle. So it unfolds. Cutler and Meredith are here. Uh, there's there's fighting there on the first day. How, who's next? Who's coming in next? Sorry, I had to uh, Sorry. put my water. Yeah, we all need water. Down. You don't want to get a cough attack like well, I had. Well, what's happening, what's happened, who's next is then basically Raleigh's division, which would normally be under Doubleday. Right. But because Reynolds is, in theory, commanding a wing today, he's got Abner Doubleday commanding the first corps. So you have Raleigh's division is going to come in, which would normally be under Doubleday. You're going to have John Robinson's division of the first corps come in. They're going to kind of take up initially a reserve position near the uh, seminary. Uh, and then eventually will some of the, his brigades will deploy along Oak Ridge and be part of some of the afternoon fighting. Uh, okay, but, of course, so. General Reynolds is not going to be with us for very long. Right. And um, I think that go was ahead. a good point, too, about one of the themes you're going to see in the Union Army on July 1st here is a lot of individuals not in the job they're usually in. Yes. Or not the job they started the day in. Right. So we're already seeing before even the first shot of the battle's fired, you have a little bit of a shakeup in command, and that's going to have a ripple effect all the way up and down. Yeah. Of course, as Jim kind of ended with the death of Reynolds, that's going to further exacerbate that 
throughout the day, which I think is an underappreciated theme of July 1st. Right. Is the Union Army, leadership-wise, it's pretty shaky. And considering that, they did a pretty good job. Absolutely, they yeah. did. Well, they yeah. do, and you know, I'm glad you mentioned that, because what do we always focus on? Confederate leadership. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, Jackson's not here, so we always talk about Ewell and Hill and some of the shakeups with that. But I mean, you talk at the Army of the Potomac right at the top. George Meade is new to command, and again, a lot of guys going down the ranks. When Reynolds is killed, when Reynolds is killed early in the action, Doubleday is thrust into a really mm-hmm. difficult situation because he doesn't really know what Reynolds's plan was and let's face it we all love baseball Abner mm-hmm. Doubleday probably not competent enough to really command the entire <laughs> field right yeah and so you know you've got Doubleday kind of saying well geez I don't know what the plan was so I'm just going to keep my line kind of between the Fairfield Road and the Chambersburg Pike and wait for the great Oliver Howard to come onto the field and take over right so all right well while that's going on on the Union side, what's going on on the Confederate side, Blade? Well, what you're going to see is what initially started as a skirmish between the skirmishers of James Archer's brigade and Joseph Davis's brigade and these cavalry vedettes. It's They're pushing across Marsh Creek. What these Confederates don't realize right now is that there is now infantry coming up on the battlefield. Hmm. So what you're going to begin to see north of the Chambersburg Pike, Joseph Davis's uh, brigade of Mississippians and one North Carolina regiment is going to engage with Lysander Cutler's men and plunging into the Herbst Woods as James Archer's Tennesseans and Alabamians moving towards them, men from Wisconsin, Indiana, and Michigan. It's the Iron Brigade. So what really now happens is this thing gets really out of control very quickly. What mm. was initially a skirmishing action, thinking you might be driving back a line of cavalry, has now turned into you're, you're dealing with infantry. And when infantry collides, it's hard to get them untangled. Yeah. And what this now does is really intensify the Battle of Gettysburg and ultimately is going to begin to draw in even more forces into this. And who are those forces that are going to be drawn in? So we'll have Henry Heath's division moving down the Chambersburg Pike. So already two of his brigades, Archer and Davis, are are fighting with Union forces. You have Johnson Pettigrew's brigade moving down, as well as John Brock and Bra's Virginia brigade as well. Further behind that, you will have William Dorsey Pender's division, one of the better divisions in the Confederate Army. Uh, Dorsey Pender, a highly regarded commander by Robert E. Lee. And then further back, you begin to get a bit of a traffic jam down the Mm -hmm. Chambersburg Pike. Lee is not anticipating a battle on July 1st, so the roads are clogged with really extra baggage. When you're preparing for a battle, you order all of that clear to the side. The only thing that needs to be going up are ambulances and bullets. Anything else to the side of the road, Lee's not prepared. So all the way back now, even moving towards Chambersburg, you will have this wagon train filled. You will have part of Richard Anderson's division of A.P. Hill's 3rd Corps on the Chambersburg Pike that day. And you will also have stuck in traffic on the Black Gap Road running up towards Shippensburg is Edward Johnson's division. Hmm. Later in the day, those two divisions being stuck in traffic, I think, is going to be one of the more critical missed opportunities for the Confederates here. That yeah, that's, that's a big deal because, I mean, you have elements of the Army of the Potomac coming in on multiple roads and coming here on the north side of town as folks tonight we're sitting on Barlow's Knoll. I right. don't know if you mentioned that. I didn't that mention that, no. Yeah, we yeah, are we're on sitting Barlow's on Barlow's Knoll. Knoll. Yep. In Contra- the shadow of Channing. Yeah, I mean, contrast what's going on on the west end of town with A.P. Hill and then Longstreet being traffic jammed on the Chambersburg Pike. Contrast that with the fairly good job that Richard Ewell does bringing his corps in on two roads. Right. And he's not going to have that same sort of traffic jam scenario that Hill and Longstreet are, are going to have. Right. Because Hill and, well, yeah, they're coming through the mountains, so they have very few choices. Yeah, basically the one road. Yeah. Um, all right. So the the morning ends. There's a lull around noon. Uh, what's going on during that lull? It's not are they just having lunch, or is there like actually stuff going on? To me, the lull is one of the more fascinating periods of the Battle of Gettysburg, mm-hmm. because if there is any chance for this battle to not see further escalation, and maybe just become kind of a footnote in a bigger campaign somewhere, it's this afternoon. And what we're going to see, really, that period between about 12 and 2 o'clock, Oliver Howard will order the Union 11th Corps, now under the command of Carl Schurz, here to Gettysburg, initially with plans to seize Oak Hill. 
which covers the approaches north and west of Gettysburg. At the same time, though, as contact has been made earlier in the day between A.P. Hill's Corps and some Union force in their front, he is going to inform Lieutenant General Richard Ewell to his north that he's encountered Union forces at Gettysburg. Richard Ewell will make the fateful decision to turn the two divisions he has at hand, Jubal Early and Robert Rhodes, early down the Harrisburg Road, Rhodes down the Carlisle Road. They are now going to be advancing down from the north, which really for the Union Army is the worst case scenario Mm -hmm. right now for them. And as we'll see uh, in a little bit after uh, noon, you will see uh, Robert Rhodes' division occupying Oak Hill, which will now force the Union 11th Corps to deploy in lower ground north of Gettysburg and, of course, sets the stage for the afternoon. Right. So he beats uh, Howard to Oak Hill, and now he's got to figure out what to do. And we're sitting in that plane now, and I can see Oak Hill over there, and I would not want to be beneath that if it's got artillery on it, but that's where he finds himself, Howard and the, the 11th Corps. So Howard gets here, though, but he's the senior general. Yeah, he's right. in town. Yeah. He's in town. He's told Reynolds has been killed. And I think, too, it's significant. Howard basically has to make a decision, and he basically says, we're going to stay here and wait for the rest of the Army to come up. Now, if Howard were under some sort of Pipe Creek order from General Meade or mm-hmm. something to that effect, he might want to consider a withdrawal. But he doesn't. And I think that's telling that he's doing what you would expect him to do in the Army. He's going to get himself into what he thinks is the best position possible and wait for the rest of the army to come up. But it's during that period, too, that he's going to put a reserve on Cemetery Hill, which is another one of those Mm -hmm. ultimately pivotal decisions that are going to impact the battle as much as any other. So whatever you might think of Howard, you got to at least give him credit. And I do give him credit for selecting Cemetery Hill. I know some people say Reynolds, some people say Buford, whoever admired Cemetery Hill as they were coming into town. It was ultimately Howard who first put the troops up there and should get the credit. I would imagine every single one of them that saw it recognized. Well, you know, and then in the glowing aftermath, I mean, hell, even Alfred Pleasanton, I think, tried to take credit for it. Right. And he's not even... Even here for a while. Yeah, I was going to say. Well, that's what I was saying, right? So even Pleasanton does. But, you know, the thing is, I think the point was made, Howard... So I'm, I just gave him credit for taking Cemetery Hill. Right. Howard, though, does have, you know, he's the guy in charge here. He does have some latitude to do something. And, and ultimately, by trying to support the right flank of the First Corps and not being able to get to Oak Hill, he is going to commit his 11th Corps into that poor position out here on the plain north of town. Well, so, something you said yeah. about Howard, essentially under the assumption that support is going to come up for him. And I think that really influences a lot of the decision-making he has. I think if you would have told Oliver Howard, the 12th Corps is not coming up. You're, you're, it's going to be you and the 1st Corps. Right. I don't think he makes the stand north and west of town. I think potentially that's when you think, let's well, err on the side of caution. Yeah, you know, and, he's, and he acknowledges that later on, and it's not just the 12th Corps, it's the 3rd Corps, too. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, he when he takes command, he's sending messages to Sickles in Emmitsburg to come on up, and he's sending messages to, um, uh, to Slocum down in front of Littlestown and two taverns to say, come on up. So, yeah, there's no doubt in my mind Sl- or Howard is gambling thinking he's got the time for more guys to come up on the field. And, of course, we know it doesn't happen. So what is the uh, original disposition of his corps when he first puts them online? So coming onto the field with three divisions, uh, you obviously remember the 11th Corps is a small corps, no more than 9,000 effectives. He is basically going to put his third division, which would normally be under Carl Schurz, but now that now – that, um, uh, Howard is commanding the field. Schertz is now commanding the 11th Corps. So again, you have mm-hmm. you have another example of guys kind of taking these battlefield promotions here. But that third division is basically going to be in the plain north of town, trying to connect with the right of the first corps. But because they don't really have the manpower to do so, he's really only going to be able to connect with them with a thick line of skirmishers. And then the rest of that division is roughly going to be running along where uh, modern day Howard Avenue is today. Barlow's first division 
which is, again, relevant to where we're sitting right now, is initially told to connect with the right of Schertz's division and kind of protect that flag. So Barlow would have been deployed or should have been deployed in some of the lower ground behind us, kind of running. Closer to the town. Yeah, kind of running from this plane, running from Howard Avenue towards the town and kind of towards the grounds of Gettysburg College today, which... I'm sure we'll get into doesn't happen. Right, right. So before I guess we get to that, then what what happens then as the Confederates start to arrive more and so on and so forth? How does this build on the on this front? Well, really, the big moment is when Robert E. Lee arrives more or less on the field of battle here at Gettysburg. Lee is not initially near the fighting when it begins on July 1st. As he begins to hear the morning action intensifying, he realizes, maybe I need to check this out. And he starts riding towards Gettysburg. Now, when Lee arrives here on July 1st, he's not initially happy. I mean, Remember, he doesn't want to be drawn into something until his army is concentrated and, and able to fight more or less on ground or in a situation of his choosing. Right. But he soon realizes that his army might be in actually an advantageous situation right now. He has high ground to the west on Hare's Ridge. He has high ground to the north on Oak Hill now. He's going to be hearing that barreling down the Harrisburg Road is Jubal Early's division, more or less into the flank and rear of the Union line. And as Lee hears this, he begins to ascertain the number of troops in his front. Uh, He'll see likely a portion of the Union line north and west of Gettysburg, but he'll know that he has right now what appears to be a superior force. Perhaps he might even be able to see part of von Steinwehr's division on Cemetery Hill, but he realizes that he has better positioning, he has more troops right now, and he's got a veteran division barreling right into the most weakest, most vulnerable part of the Union line. Right now, Lee's decision, it's not the battlefield of his choosing, but certainly the scenario of his choosing. Mm. But, but we get, I'm sorry. But, but, and we see Lee, of course, making that decision to, to assume the offensive. But we got to give Ewell credit, too, mm-hmm. because meanwhile, while all this has been going on, Ewell has been coming in from the north, coming in from the north and the northeast, because as we alluded to before, he's got Rhodes' division coming in on one road, which is going to take ultimately Oak Hill. He's got Early's division kind of coming in on the old Harrisburg Road. And that's really Ewell's doing. You know, Ewell had been told, directed to come to Gettysburg or Cashtown as circumstances might dictate. And putting his divisions on those two roads is going to give him an opportune ability to basically come in and strike the 11th Corps in the flank and the front. And I do want to give you all credit because, as we know, he's been criticized later on for failure to take Cemetery Hill Mm -hmm. and all of that sort of thing. But you will, even though he has been told... Don't bring on a general engagement. When he comes in, when he comes in from the north side of town, he sees that opportunity to strike what he thinks is the right flank of the Army of the Potomac, and he does it. So we've got to give Yule credit. And in Yule's words, he'll say in his report, at this point, the battle was essentially unavoidable. Right, right. We're we're in it now. Yeah. And, and I think we often, you know, in the in the as we study this battle, we often find officers that we feel need saving. I mean for gosh sakes, we've had how many years of trying to save George Meade right now? How many years of saving James Longstreet? Yeah. If ever there is an officer on this battlefield that I think deserves yeah. a reevaluation, it's Richard Ewell. I agree. I agree. And, and I think what we forget is we really judge Ewell for what happens in the afternoon. Right. Let's look at what he is doing right now. Up yeah. to this point, he has swept Union troops out of the Shenandoah Valley. He has been the vanguard of Lee's army into Pennsylvania seemingly on the heels almost of capturing Harrisburg. Of course, he's pulled back before he can do that. And then here on the morning of July 1st, he could have easily continued down the Heidlersburg Road and make his way towards Cashtown. He's following his orders. But, of course, he realizes, you know what? If Hill sees somebody, I'm moving down to be in support. Worst case scenario, we take the Mummasburg Road and the Chambersburg Pike to the Cashtown area. Right. Either way, I'm coming down. So what we're seeing is an officer that is being very decisive and making a lot of good decisions. So I think the standard interpretation we have of Yule is kind of this bumbling, balding, one-legged general that doesn't push in the first day, but he's a much more dynamic general than I think he gets credit for. Yeah, it's always been it's always been told in a way that it seems like he just materialized out of the ground mm-hmm. right here and you know, nothing that he did beforehand 
was his decision or whatever. Just right. poof, there's right. Yule in his core. Um, all right, so they get on the scene though. What? Ha- well, so I guess let's get Barlow out here. Okay. All right. Barlow comes out to what is now known as Barlow's Knoll. What was it called then? Or what Blocker, was it? Blocker's Blocker. Knoll. We have the Blocker Farm on the other side of the hill over here. And uh, so he comes out. Why? What's what's his? Uh, he's not ordered to come out here. No, he isn't. And, and you know, this is. And I hate to. You no, actually, I don't hate to use the analogy, but it's the sickles of the first day, exactly. right? I mean, it is. And certainly, I yeah, I do a fair number of Bar- Barlow's Knoll tours because I I like the topic, I like the ground out here, I like the similarities to sickles on July second. But if you go, if you go into some of the low ground that Barlow was originally in, and we're talking again, heading heading towards town. What is it? Is it wise the supermarket? Yes, it's the supermarket yes. over here. Um, kind of the grounds where Hack is today. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's a, an AG Center or whatever it is today, which at the right. time was the Adams County Alms House, the poor house. If you go into that ground today and you look to the northeast, the direction that Jubal Early's division is coming from, Blocker's Knoll looms in front of Barlow's position as a potentially significant obstacle. You can't see the other side of the hill, beyond the hill. Mm -hmm. You can't see the approach of the enemy. And there are some accounts that even when Barlow gets into the low ground, Dole's Brigade, who is coming up, also from north to south, Dole's Brigade might already have some skirmishers up here taking shots at his guys. So Barlow's in that low ground. No, he's not ordered to take the position. But what he is ordered to do is to protect the right flank of that third division, Schertz's old division. And, you know, Barlow never really explained specifically why he did what he did. And that's one difference between him and Sickles. And I think probably it's one reason why people don't hate Barlow as much as they hate Sickles because he doesn't go on this, you know, 20 to 50 years sort of vendetta ride. He never really says why he moved forward. But if you sit in the low ground and think, I've got to move forward to take the high ground, get a better sight line of the enemy approaching, the move, just from a terrain perspective, has some logic to it. And also, you mentioned Dole's Brigade. They're coming down, what, the Carlisle Pike-ish, mm-hmm. like that area? Yeah. And uh, and if his job is to protect the right flank and there's Dole's, doesn't he move out here and initially face west-ish? Yeah, well, you know, part of the problem is, as we said, with the 11th Corps in general being a small corps, the the drawback to this is by moving up onto this knoll he doesn't have enough guys to really adequately face in both directions right yes folks he has created wait for it wait for it a salient (laughs) again and so yeah he's facing in both directions i I do think initially a couple of his red regiments are facing to the north as we said they're going to chase off i think some of doles skirmishers but the real threat right now is going to be early coming in from the northeast, not only with infantry, but early is deploying some artillery up opposite what is today the Gettysburg High School on a, what we call today Jones Avenue within the park. Mm. And that's obviously mm. going to be the the undoing of Barlow. I don't think Barlow comes up here one time. You know, we tend to think of all these orders as sort of coordinated. OK, everybody, get up and go. You know, he puts skirmishers up here. He puts some of Wilkinson's battery up here. Then it's Von Gilsa's small brigade. Then it's Adel- or Delbert Ames's brigade. <laughs> it's kind of a piecemeal right. thing. Yeah. To, at one point, then Schertz looks around and says, what the hell? Barlow's out of position. And I think the, the way that it kind of escalates, as Jim said, it's not one massive movement up right. here. It, it's kind of a, a regiment here, a brigade here, a battery there. And I think... You know, with the anniversary, you get all the diehards in town, mm-hmm. and there'll be no shortage of of individuals around bar stools in town that'll give you the most sage interpretations sure. of this battlefield imaginable. And I think it's easy to be a general after the fact, of course. And what I always stress to people as they study the battle: if you want to understand the battle, don't fixate on what you know about the situation. Focus on what the individuals at the moment right. would have known. Right. To, to sort of steal a phrase from the Watergate hearings, what what did the president know and when did he know it? <laughs> well, what do these commanders know and when did they know it? What do they see? When do they see it? And I think what we see 
is if you're in Barlow's position, you're really not that aware of what's barreling down the Harrisburg Road. And as much credit as we give Buford and his men for the morning, Thomas Devins guys don't do the most bang up job in in the afternoon. Well, remember, and some of them are out here, and um, they do give some intel of the Confederate approach. But the problem is, is they start taking friendly fire from Eleventh Corps batteries up around Cemetery Hill. Mm. Howard is shooting at Buford. Mm. Imagine that, folks. <laughs> oh, <laughs> now, now we've just made Howard the most hated man. That would have been a Gettysburg. great. That would have been yeah. a great scene in like hour five of the movie or something. <laughs> and, and what we see at this point, if you're not aware of the threat coming from your north. You've got heavy skirmishing off really between the knoll that we're on right now, Barlow's Knoll, back towards Oak Hill. Right. Because you have George Doles' brigade essentially deployed as skirmishers out there. Yeah. You're fixated on the enemy to really your northwest. Right. That's where the threat seems to be coming from. Well, you're looking in that direction. I think the way that he uh, moves his men out, I think it shows an escalation of that fighting mm-hmm. in the Gettysburg Plain. And as a fun note, well, maybe not a fun note if people don't care, uh, my great-great-grandfather in the 4th Georgia is involved in that fighting at this very time, right behind me where I'm sitting. So probably he'll get right shot now, in the leg. he'll get shot in the leg later in the day. We don't know if it's during the skirmishing or later, but I'll never make fun of the 11th Corps shooting because they almost made it to where I wouldn't be here. He's, yeah. not, uh, he's not Colonel Wynn, the guy that gets killed and gets the gold tooth ransomed? It's not, maybe, it's not no, your... but you know what? I bet if he had found the, the tooth, he probably would have taken it back home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, Early's, uh, Early's men come in. There's a fighting here at uh, Barlow's Knoll. How long does the, the fighting last here? Is it, did they just sweep them off the field, or is it a good uh, slog? Well, so, there, so there's a couple things here. First of all, I just want to add, too, because I want to bring somebody else onto the field. Okay. Uh, we haven't talked about uh, Shevnoski. Chris Noski, Chris, <laughs> as we prefer to call yeah, him. Sure. Um, so I'm just going to call him Chris, and you know, let the uh, the let, Chris let the hate come in the for Chris. for that. That we're, I'm not even attempting the correct pronunciation. <laughs> But one of the, when Schertz saw Barlow had moved forward, mm-hmm. Schertz said, my God, you know, if nothing else, Barlow's lost connection with that third division. I need to bring Chris kind of in to cover that gap. So I just wanted to make sure we got Chris into the story here. Sure, yeah. Because it really wouldn't be fair to no, do this, that would to do not this be. without also, Chris. There are a lot of Chris fans out there. Big picture, the standard interpretation is early barrels down, the 11th Corps folds like a cheap chair, and it's without the Iron Brigade... The first core would have been destroyed. The battle would have been lost. At the same time, this drama is about <laughs> to happen here on the knoll we're on right now. Right. Biddle's brigade is their flank is already being turned by Pettigrew. So B- Biddle's brigade is over on the left to our south along McPherson's Ridge. So yeah. Sometimes we we first try to core. compartmentalize the battle. Right. But we have to keep in mind as this action here on the knoll is happening to our south. The, end, the other Union flank is beginning to give way. Yes. And so what you'll see is really the same amount of time it takes for Early and Doles, with support from Doles, to clear these Union troops out of here. It's about the same amount of time it takes to clear them off of McPherson's Ridge as well. So I think we need to give a little bit uh, more of a fair shake to the 11th Corps here. Uh, they're not the Flying Dutchmen as they are commonly viewed. And I think to know that at the same time that these guys are getting absolutely shattered here on the knoll, so is Biddle's guys. Yeah, uh, yeah. So it's already, as I say, both ends buckle about the same time, and that leads the eventual line to break. Well, you know, Von Gilsa's brigade out here in Barlow's Knoll is a small one, and right. you got to acknowledge that. They're facing off against John B. Gordon's well-led, mm-hmm. highly motivated brigade that's kind of coming in Early's front line. You know, Gordon is riding this big black stallion that he had captured at Winchester. You know, somebody says that he looked absolutely thrilling. You know, there was that famous often quote uh, to the effect that it had put fight into a whooped chicken just to look at him. I mean, <laughs> was Gordon, that Matt Atkinson? <laughs> I would not say that. I would, oh, okay. no, no comment. No comment. But, but obviously Gordon's guys coming in are really like a steamroller you know we talked we talked on sunday the barksdale steamroller i would say this is equal or more so there's one quote where somebody one of the one of the guys in gordon's um brigade says to the effect of the yankees put up a fight like i'd never seen them fight before you know fence to fence sort of thing and historians tend to fall back on that one a lot to say Mm -hmm. look barlow's Mm -hmm. guys put up a good fight up here and that sort of thing 
Barlow, on the other hand, you know, basically said to his mummy in that famous letter mm. afterwards, he basically said to the effect of, you know, I had my men in an admirable position, mummy, and no fight at all was made. <laughs> so I think probably the truth is somewhere in between. In between, yeah. I think so. And I think where I'm sitting right now, I am looking more or less from the flank of Von Gelsa's brigade right now. And what right I can flank. see is I can see the tree line above Rock Creek which is a Civil War era tree line. If I am here at this moment, what I would be seeing is a Union skirmish line that was along Rock Creek now pouring back here as quick as they can. Right. And no sooner than they're now coming into our lines, I see the Georgians cresting that. And I think the way I interpret it is I think the initial attack is very quick. It's very violent. That line collapses very quickly, mm-hmm. and any line would have collapsed here. You could have put the Iron Brigade here. Yes. And it's going to happen. Yes, yes. But what I think you do see is after that initial sledgehammer blow, the 11th Corps is able to somewhat stem the tide a little bit. It's not a complete route, and you're going to see some heavy fighting here north of Gettysburg that I think does not get really the, the attention it, it deserves in a lot of cases. Well, I want to make sure we then bring in Adelbert or Adelbert. Mm-hmm. Sorry, folks. Sometimes I say Adelbert. Sometimes I say Adelbert. Uh, Ames's Brigade. I think Ames is a good officer. I know I have colleagues who don't like Ames. I am not an anti-Ames camp. Why don't they like him? Oh, I don't know. He was mean to his men and and, and stuff like that. No, remember, he was... Guides are very sensitive. Yes, (laughs) apparently. He was, remember, he was the original commander of the 20th Maine and who was very much the role model to Joshua Chamberlain. And I can tell with Eric the producer, that's not a selling point. You know what, Eric the producer? Damn it, that is a selling point. (laughs) And so what happens is, you know, now initially, now I'm not backpedaling here, but initially the men of the 20th Maine did not like Ames because he was a taskmaster. He was a drill master. Tom Chamberlain had said, you know, we're going to shoot him before the first mm-hmm. battle that we're in. But it was really to Ames who had drilled the 20th Maine and a young Colonel Chamberlain into the fighting force mm-hmm. That they became. Right. And I think as you sit here on Barlow's Knoll and we go back to that Eric's portrait of kind of Von Gilsa's skirmishers coming up over the Knoll, Gordon's guys and then other brigades kind of following them. Ames is in a tough spot here. I think Ames does as good of a job as anybody trying to stem the route, but eventually they're going to start to fall back towards what would have been the grounds of the almshouse behind us. And part of that reason, and I think a, a underappreciated brigade commander on july 1st is george doles Mm -hmm. he's out almost kind of an independent command he is really if you look at Rhodes division doles's brigade in terms of numbers and experience is probably his most solid brigade at this point doles is one of his most experienced commanders he's the perfect guy to kind of hold that skirmish line that initially in the afternoon is very important And what we see is Gordon, as this attack is happening, Doles reads the situation very well. And by Doles throwing in when he does only adds to the pressure, Mm. which I think Gordon does a magnificent job of getting his guys onto the field. But don't discount what Doles does to help further this attack. I mean, how many times do we look at the Civil War where one brigade will have a smashing attack, but there's never that follow up? Right. Think about Barksdale, going back to the Sickles example. Uh, Doles does exactly what he's supposed to do, and that adds that further pressure, which puts a brigade like Ames in that tough right. spot. Do I defend against right, Gordon, right. or do I defend against Doles? Well, and then when, I can't do either. Then when Ames goes off the field, the two sides tag team Chris. Yep. And then Chris is off the field, and kind of just like dominoes, you start to see that 11th Corps line coming apart. This is a textbook flank attack. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as it uh, comes apart and uh, the routing begins... Whoever, 1st Corps or 11th Corps, it doesn't matter who broke first, but they start to uh, fall back and go through town. Um, what's the fighting like in town? Because this is something we don't hear a ton about. Yeah. Usually yeah. it's just like it's like they just skipped through the town and went to Cemetery Hill, but there was more to it than well, that. Well, yeah, I mean, as Gettysburg residents, you all know the narrow streets in town, mm-hmm. the obstacles that the buildings are going to provide, things of that nature. I mean, the, note, the most noteworthy action here on the outskirts of town is Howard finally releases a brigade from his reserve, mm-hmm. Coster's Brigade of Von Steinwehr's division, They're finally released off of 
Cemetery Hill to come into the north side of town here specifically for the purpose of trying to cover the retreat. Right. So you have you have that fight in the brick, what we call the brickyard, because there were some brick ovens there, and uh, Coster's Brigade is outflanked, mm-hmm. overrun back through the town and um you know so at that point it's a mix you know both sides are getting badly mixed up first score others do put some up some batteries in the town square heckman's 11th core battery Mm -hmm. up near the college so the yankees do put some artillery in play to kind of stop the um confederate advance and what what did they do with heckman's battery did they do it uh, like in sections, shooting down yeah, the yeah. various ways into town. Yeah, yeah. So it wasn't like the whole battery on one street. It was like a section here, a section yeah, there, so. all facing yeah, north. I think so. Yeah, I think so. You know, you have the. I was just going to say, you have that great story, the Forty Fifth mm-hmm. New York, who uh, basically kind of gets corralled in one of the buildings across from the. Uh, uh, the Lutheran Church was St. Jude. It's the Eagle Hotel, isn't it? Yeah. Basically across the street from the 7-Eleven. Well, I was yeah, going yeah. well, to say kind of where the uh, Blue Parrot used to be. But, yeah. you know, that so that dates us. Yeah, yes, well, yes. That, that's why You're I was dating trying, yourself, no, no, I was trying to think of something, something more modern for, the, uh, for, the, for all the trendy kids who listen to podcasts. <laughs> but anyways, The trendy kids that listen to podcasts are old now. Yeah. That, 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 I mean, that know the Blue Parrot. It's not cool yeah. anymore, man. It's but not anyways, there anymore. Anyways, because I know we're probably running short on time there's a cool fight where basically some of the 45th new york is kind of held mm-hmm. up in and around some of the buildings right. on a uh, chambersburg street and i like i love the story right because they're willing to do or die mm-hmm. and fight till the last man you know until a confederate officer kind of comes in the lines and kind of says hey hey Let's take a look at this, you know, kind of see how mm-hmm. hopeless the uh, situation is. But yeah. it's still a great story well, that doesn't get told enough. And I think the another to me, the most compelling story of July 1st, you know, as much credit as, as Buford gets, as much credit as other units get on this battlefield. I think the underappreciated units and if we kind of go from end of the Union line to the other units like Coster's brigade heckman's battery the 16th, 16th Maine, Maine, the 45th yeah. new york 151st pennsylvania um heck even stone's brigade mm-hmm. hanging on as long as they do these are the underappreciated units that you know what the movies aren't going to focus on these guys yeah it's not the alamo like defense yeah. it's not the heroic charge and take the position these are men that are ultimately sacrificing themselves so that the rest of that army can potentially live to fight another day. Right. Yeah. And I don't think we give enough credit to what they do. They buy pockets of minutes. And I think on July 1st, the, the most valuable asset the Union Army has is time. And they're buying time for them. Yeah, I mean, the reality is his interpretations in that afternoon on McPherson's mm-hmm. Ridge and Seminary Ridge on July 1st is easily one of the most overlooked mm-hmm. aspects of the battle. Yeah. It easily and is. And one of the bloodiest yeah, right. aspects oh, yeah. of the battle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, all right. So, uh, the they get through the town. They uh, start to rally and form lines on uh, Cemetery Hill. What happens with the high command uh, as the evening sets in? Well, back in Tawny Town, when Meade had learned of Reynolds' death, he had sent forward Winfield S. Hancock basically to judge and assess whether or not Gettysburg would be a more suitable position to fight from than some of these positions they're thinking of in Maryland. Uh-huh. So while Hancock is coming up, we have this First Corps and 11th Corps retreat primarily, mm-hmm. concurrently happening Same time coming into town. You have Howard initially um, trying to rally the troops on Cemetery Hill with help from Doubleday, Mm -hmm. Buford, other guys of that nature. Uh, One of my favorite stories, you know, we mentioned Division Commander Thomas Rowley before. Rowley is, okay, is either drunk... (laughs) Or he's just highly confused. I, you know, I'm not... Maybe well, both. Maybe a little bit of both <laughs> kind of thing. You know, how, you know who right, hasn't been drunk and confused in Gettysburg? Exactly. Certainly on Cemetery Hill, right? Yeah. At the end of a long day, <laughs> right? But, but you know, so Raleigh kind of maybe thinks Doubleday is dead and maybe that he commands the first quarter. Corps kind of starts giving some wild and conflicting orders. It's a heartwarming story. They eventually have to kind of put him under arrest at this moment of crisis but while all this is going on hancock arrives on the field and uh as any good gettysburg aficionado knows hancock has basically uh an order for meade saying look even though you are junior you can 
you know, take charge and, and replace whom you see fit. And Hancock basically says to Howard, look, I'm in charge here. Howard says, no, I'm not. But they come to an agreement. And long story short, they both work now to put the troops on Cemetery Hill, get some troops over to Culp's Hill as you get into the early evening. And the 12th Corps starts to arrive on the field and even eventually put some of Geary's guys south in and around the round tops. Starting to, you know, nobody says rally around the fish mm-hmm. hook but it's the idea that okay we're vulnerable on the flanks let's get some guys on these hills but it starts to take the fledgling shape of the fish hook that's going to be so important tomorrow and what's going on with lee at this point so what lee has seen is a union army on the fleeing the field they're moving through the streets of gettysburg he still has daylight mm. that's something that needs to be appreciated too and what Lee is watching is a Union force, probably somewhat in some level of confusion, probably also some pockets of of inline troops. But Lee is seeing more or less a confused opponent in his front. Lee has daylight. He's got his army advancing. Lee will do what I think most commanders would naturally want to do, press that advantage. And I think what Lee is also realizing, one of his objectives in Pennsylvania is to resupply his army. Any day his army is fighting is the day he can't feed his army. Right. So the quicker he can knock out this section of the Union Army based on their past results, you bloody their nose, they're going to retreat. That means Lee can simply pull back into the mountains and essentially gorge his army in the Cumberland Valley. So I think he's looking for this decisive moment. And... And we should note, Robert E. Lee is not what we would call a micromanager. No. That's not his leadership style. What Lee understands is as an Army commander, he cannot see everything. So he needs to leave a good bit of latitude to his corps commanders to make those decisions. And that's what every corps commander is most, generally speaking, should be authorized to do. Right. So what he will say to General Richard Ewell is, is more or less, General Ewell, take that hill, meaning Cemetery Hill, if practical. And Richard Yule is not one of those that does well with very kind of vague mm-hmm. orders, even before this battle. Uh, at one point, Yule will, even before the, even the first day, he will utter to his commanders, he'll, he'll be reading mm-hmm. an order, looks at it again, reads it, puts it down, reads it again. He eventually says, is there anybody at Army headquarters that can issue an intelligible order? <laughs> so Yule needs very detailed, specific orders. Right. And think about who Yule worked for before this. Jackson. Jackson. Jackson gives you those exact orders. Right. So Yule has never worked under Robert E. Lee directly. So I think you're going to see, once again, we talk about the issues in the Union Army with command changes. This is where you're seeing the reverberations of that reorganization. And as we can all relate in your own job, it takes you a while to understand kind of the idiosyncrasies Mm -hmm. and style of your boss. Yep. And Yule's trying to do that. And I think what he has seen at this point as much as the Union Army is in disarray, so is the Confederate Army as they're going yeah. through Gettysburg. They're falling out mm-hmm. looking for prisoners. They're looking to loot houses. They're they're disorganized. Right. It's not an organized pursuit no. through the town. And, and really, the Union Army is lucky the town of Gettysburg is where it is. Yeah. I mean, that's been an open field. Yeah. This thing's they're yeah. getting routed. Different story. Yeah, yeah. The town breaks up this initial Confederate wave. Also, he's going to hear that there is reports of Union forces advancing down the York Road. If you're going to be launching an attack against Cemetery Hill, just look at your map of Gettysburg. That potentially puts an enemy force of unknown size on your flank. Yeah. So you've got disorganized troops. You've got this report of Union forces coming in from the east, potentially. And also, you've got a number of units that are pretty badly damaged. Shot up. Even Gordon's men, in a smashing success, lose 20%. Mm-hmm. I mean, only at Gettysburg do we just casually say, all oh, 20% casually. So yeah. Only yeah. 20% only. casually. Only. You know, and so what we see is Yule is interpreting all of this. He is also still thinking about Robert E. Lee's previous order of don't bring well, on a further for engagement. Yeah. Yeah. So put yourself in his in his shoe. Yeah. His shoe. <laughs> <laughs> all of that just for that line. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, they call me Long Game Lindblade, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, so now, as but now, what you see is you put yourself in Yule's shoes. He doesn't have all the information. He doesn't know what's going on, and eventually, he will, well, do nothing. He does yeah. not push, and and th- he will be faulted for the rest of his life for this. And I think, in the circumstance, he made 
the right decision. I, I agree. Think. Our mo- one of our most popular episodes is, is the is the titled "What If Jackson Was at Gettysburg?" Mm-hmm, and right. we really analyze Richard Yule. It's really more of a leadership. It's a study of Yule's leadership on July first, and I yeah. think we've done battlefield seminars yeah. on this. We've done yeah. programs on this. Our general consensus is, if Yule would have tried, I don't think he would have taken it. I don't think he has the no. force. I don't think he has the ability. It's just one of those things. It's a bridge too far for him. But, yeah. of course, most people like very simple interpretations. Right. If only Richard Yule had pushed, we would have won the war. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Well, was, that, who, was that anybody we know? Or was that just sort of, maybe. Maybe so it's like, <laughs> so. But I think it's, it's like 10% of the people that comment. Richard Yule is unfairly judged. Yeah. I, no, I totally um, agree. I think it, he gets it, a bad rap. Let me just add one thing to that, because you're right. We brought in the piece about not bringing on a general engagement. The other piece of that that i'll just add is you will actually then goes over to hill and says look can general hill support me who is robert e lee closest to physically i mean he is near hill, hill. at that point yeah. and hill basically says i don't have troops to spare and lee doesn't object to that you know one of the things we've said for many years while we blame gettys quote unquote blame gettysburg on you on longstreet on stewart AP Hill gets a free pass. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, you have you have Lane's brigade, Thomas's brigade, people of that nature that could potentially be thrown in at this late hour. I know other other factors. Well Lee gets a pass too. Well, that's what it comes down to. But it all to. is on his shoulders. That's what it comes down to. I mean, at the end of the day, take that hill of practicable, but don't bring on a general engagement. Right. If you want a direct assault or expect a direct assault, say it. And if you're not going to come over to supervise it, you know, send one of your trusted staff officers over to keep an eye on it. I right, mean, there's right, different right. things that could have been in, implemented and don't. So I agree. I am uh, definitely favorable to you. I think we should take a harder look at A.P. Hill. And I think general. it's important to consider what A.P. Hill's men would have been looking at. We always focus on what Yule's guys are looking at, looking up at Cemetery Hill yeah. in that area. Drive down more or less to where the National Guard Armory is on Seminary Ridge today. And l- imagine what you would have been looking at across that field, mm-hmm. uh, more through what today we call Colt Park, looking right. back through that towards <laughs> Try to Avenue. imagine that's all gone. What you would have been looking at is really part of William Gamble's mm-hmm. brigade there. There's nothing really else there. Right, right. It's a, that is a much easier path to go on July right. 1st, and I think... It's not only that, Hill would have had the ability, as, as Jim said, you've got Thomas's brigade that's not seen the action. You've got Brock and Bra's men that have really not seen much action. You have even part of Pettigrew's guys that could have probably gone in. You've got Lane. You've got forces there that could potentially have gotten a foothold there at that time. Also, that southern end of town, there is no town. Right. It's open. Right. Yule's guys have to go open. for the town. Mm-hmm. Hill doesn't. So... I think if anybody wants to get the blame for the mm-hmm. missed opportunity for the Confederates on July 1st, it's A.P. Hill. Mm-hmm. Sure. Hill has the means, and he also has the ability to do so. Yule did not. And folks should check out our six-part Thomas's Brigade episode on the Battle of Gettysburg podcast. It's electrifying, man. Six parts. <laughs> not six parts. <laughs> and that just gets them to Gettysburg, folks. <laughs> That's just the march up here. Well, guys, uh, thank you very much for uh, for coming on to do this. Is that all? Yeah, that's all. We're going <laughs> to leave it there, and then when we do the July 2nd episode, we're going to start a little late in the evening of July 1st and work our way in. Fair enough. Uh, but uh, thanks again, guys, for doing this. Battle of Gettysburg podcast. Find it anywhere you find podcasts, correct? Yes. And after we sign off, we're all going to have a group hug because yeah. we are all friends. That's right. We don't hate each other, so sorry to all of you people out there who yes, want us and to. And if you're an internet troll that keeps stirring the proverbial, well, excrement, yes. uh, we will hunt you down. Or yes, in the, we the beer gardens, like the Farnsworth yeah. House, yes. and things like Give it a yeah. rest. Give yeah. it a rest. Give it a rest. Folks. People, there's way too many things in the world going on for you, you to waste your exactly. time worrying about a podcast. And you know what? We have fun together, and you we shouldn't be such a lump on a log right. and join us. That's right. Yeah, that's right. If only the listeners could see the smiles on our face right now, they would know how much fun we're having. We've been beaming from ear to ear the whole time. <laughs> Unlike Von Gilsa's brigade. Here. <laughs> All right. There you go. That's a good end. So and we, we never will... stop talking, too. That's why we have six part episodes. <laughs> right. yes. You're just going to, Eric, the producer, is just going to have to pull the plug, and, and we're not going to stop. Have to yeah. Take a sledgehammer to the yeah. recorder. Oh, no, I'm fine. 
Right. Well, I've got a migraine, so I'm going home to take some Advil. And uh, thank you all for listening. We'll talk to you tomorrow for July 2nd. Our hearts so stout have got us fame. For suit is known from whence we came. Wherever we go, they dread the name of Gary Owen and Glory. Instead, it's follow, drink down there, and pay the reckoning on the nail. No man for dead shall go to jail from Gary Owen and Glory. Instead, it's follow, drink down there, and pay the reckoning on the nail. No man for dead shall go to jail.